Good morning, welcome to the FIG Securities webinar. My name is Elizabeth Moran and today uh, we're joined with Tony Negline, our resident SMSF expert. Morning to Tony, it's a bit of a mouthful. It is indeed. Morning Liz. Um, so today we're going to be talking about super, superannuation in 2019, what you need to know. I'd like to just extend a welcome to anyone that hasn't joined us before for a webinar and we appreciate your, you're on the line. If you miss anything or um, perhaps want to review something later, we will send a link to the recording after the webinar. So Tony is actually Head of Superannuation at Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand and has had many, many years in the field. He wrote a column for The Australian for over 10 years and is uh, well and truly a, na a national expert travels widely and speaks widely. So we're really uh, delighted to have you here today, Tony. Before I hand over to Tony, just a couple of housekeeping uh, rules, if you like. On the top right hand side of your screen, you see an orange arrow. If that's not expanded, if you can click on that, you'll see the panel expands and uh, about halfway down you should see an area where you can type in and ask us a question. We've had a number of questions already in. Most of them are to do with the franking credits and uh, changes there. And we do address this later in the presentation. So we'll hold those questions until we've uh, hit that part of the presentation. But without further ado, uh, I'll hand over to Tony. Thanks, Tony. All right, thank you, Liz. And uh, uh, as Liz said, good morning, everyone. All right, so let's get straight into it. So that's our lovely little disclaimer, which um, I'll let you read at your leisure later on, maybe. Um, so what we plan to do is just discuss um, in relatively short order uh, eight particular issues. One is um, a quick review of some of the things you might want to think about in relation to the changes the government first announced in 2016. Uh, we also want to talk about the downsizer contribution. So uh, there are quite a lot of people who are interested in that now that it has started. Uh, we'll also look at something that is um, at the moment only applying to a very small number of self-managed super funds. Uh, but may apply to a larger number if the government gets some legislation through, and that's the non-arms length uh, income issues. Uh, there is also, the government have, have a policy in place about uh, SMSFs potentially only doing three year audits. Uh, and I realise that we already have a question that came in this morning about that particular topic. So um, we will talk for a little bit of time about that policy, uh, what it might mean for your fund if you're interested in that policy. Uh, whether or not you'll save any money and more particularly whether or not it'll actually be legislated. So we'll, we'll, I'll fill you in on where that is all at. Um, as you would appreciate it at, uh, at the Chartered Accounting Body, we have quite a few members of ours who actually audit SMSFs. So um, I'm reasonably heavily involved in, in that particular topic. Uh, we'll also obviously look at the proposed Labor Party changes. So that, that there's two issues there. One is capital gains tax and the other is um, the other is uh, franking credits, which of course is the big, the big topic um, of the day, or one of the big topics of the day. Uh, and we'll look at, there are two very interesting court cases. One involves an SMSF auditor, and the other involves a deceased estate involving claiming money from, from a self-managed super fund or self-managed superannuation funds, uh, and involves the Hems family, which uh, um, are involved, which are involved here in Sydney in running pubs and clubs and, and other sorts of uh, venues. Lastly, but not least, we, of course we can't, leave a session today alone without obviously talking about the Royal Commission, uh, which is looking into misconduct in the banking, superannuation and financial services uh, industries uh, to give its official title, and also the Productivity Commission. So uh, the Productivity Commission is looking at the efficiency and effectiveness of the superannuation sector. And uh, they produced a draft report around about eight weeks ago of, uh, of a mere 500 and odd, 550 odd pages, plus uh, quite a lot of appendices. So there's a lot to talk about in relation to that Productivity Commission and where all of those things might lead and, and time frame and so on and so forth. So that's our agenda. All right, so to crack on um, with the 2016 superannuation changes, here are some things that you need to think about very carefully. Um, and, and I'm going to assume that you run your own fund or, or to a large extent run your own, run your own superannuation fund. Um, if you had, the first question is, have you submitted your 2017 return uh, for your fund? Uh, most people use a tax agent, and if you didn't, if you use a tax agent, you had until 30 June this year to submit your 17 annual return. And I suppose the issue is that there are still some people who are running a little bit late with running their return. The ATR were very generous in offering extensions to people beyond 30 June if that was required. 
Now, if you do use a tax agent, did they apply for an extension? Have they actually actioned that? Um, you, and if you haven't heard about your return, then you might want to get cracking in relation to that. A key component with that, with that 2017 annual return is the CGP, CGT cost-based relief that was available for assets that were moving from the pension phase back into the accumulation phase. So that was moving the cost base of the asset for CGT purposes from the original cost base to the prevailing market value. Uh, depending on how you do your accounts, there were different rules at different time, different different ways of applying that rule. Um, it, it is very important that you get those numbers right and it is very important that you get the that you understand what is actually being done in your fund. Uh, and I would encourage you to talk about your to your accountant, SMSF administrator, so on and so forth, to make sure you understand what's being done there. Uh, and to really get to the bottom of, of what is going on. Uh, by the 30th of June this year, uh, all SMSFs should, well, right now, you should be doing what is called transfer balance account reporting or TVARS, uh, and that is that you've started a pension, you've stopped a pension, there's a range of other transactions as well. There are about nine different transactions where you've actually got to send in the ATA your transfer balance account reporting. And what we all, what we know from that is that we know that already some errors have been identified in people's records. Um, the transfer balance account and the $1.6 million limit and all those other sorts of things is very similar to the reasonable benefit limit rules that existed uh, before 2007. Uh, and all of these sorts of errors that are appearing now under the transfer balance account report uh, were appearing in the old RBL rules and it was a and it was it was a shocking system to have to work through. Um, I'm surprised that some of these errors have started to appear already. Uh, incorrect data being sent to the ATO, not being sent by the right time, double double reporting of pensions, double reporting of ceasing of pensions, all sorts of errors are already starting to emerge. Uh, what I encourage you to do is to, if you have a pension with in a self managed fund and potentially maybe a pension in another fund, let's say a, a, a fund that is regulated by APRA or a government run fund, what you should consider doing is going to the ATO and asking for a data download of the records they have so that you can check to make sure it's right. Uh, and if you find any errors, then you can obviously go go around and, and fix those up. So it is very important that you make sure those, that that will potentially have an impact on your life later on, maybe not for the next few years, but it potentially will have an impact. And you need to make sure that data in that transfer balance account report for you is actually accurate. As I say, it will have an impact on your life later on. The next thing is the total super balance. The total super balance is the, is the amount of money you have in super, both pension and accumulation. And it determines whether or not in, in the main, whether or not additional superannuation, a range of additional superannuation contributions, in particular non-concessional contributions, additional ones can actually be made. It's determined on the 30 June of the previous financial year. So we're now in the 18, 19 year. So uh, your total super balance for this financial year is determined on the 30th of June, 2018. For SMSFs, what the ATO do is that they take the data from your SMSF annual return and the member account balance in there. Now that should be based on net market value. Now, of course, you may actually have a different value there. When, when that doesn't include the cost, the, that in most SMSFs, there's no tax effective accounting because there's no need to, to do that. What you might find though, is that of course, it doesn't take into account the cost of selling assets and any CGT and so on and so forth. It may be worth your while to talk to your advisors about whether or not you should self-report a different total super balance to the to the ATO, you do that through a transfer balance account report. So if you have a total super balance above 1.6 million or above some other thresholds that are in play, you might find that when you take into account um, uh, selling costs of your assets that you actually fall below various thresholds and you report that through your total super balance. It's a little bit of a complex topic, but talk to your advisors about that because it is, it may enable you, by doing those sorts of things, it may enable you to make some additional contributions that you otherwise could not have done so. So it may be in your interest to to, uh, to send in some additional data. We have a question, Tony, uh, from John. He asks, what do you suggest should be done if your employer has contributed too much into your SMSF and uh, your yearly concessional contribution has been breached? Okay, so you, you should just let the system take care of itself. So what we'll have, so John, what you should do is 
the ATO will write to you and say you have an excess concessional contribution cap issue. Uh, they give you a short amount of time to, you, you've got, you effectively got two choices. You leave the money in there and pay tax at your marginal rate, or you take the money, you take then say, okay, to the ATO, take that money out of the system and they then tax you at your marginal rate. If you do the latter one, take the money out of the system, they tax it at your marginal rate, so they basically add it to your assessable income and tax at marginal rate, and then they add on a notional earnings, notional earnings and tax that at a difference. So, so they, they tax you at a little bit higher, because they, they assume the money's been sitting in the fund for a little bit of time and, and make, make some notional earnings. So just let the system take care of itself. Um, there's no point you taking the money out. What, happen, what happens is the fund actually sends the money to the ATO, the ATO then take the, its tax out, and then remit the excess to you uh, if there's any money if there's any any money left over. I will warn you though that if you owe the ATO any money, what they'll do is they'll swipe that from any refund that you do you do as well. Um, okay. Mm. So all right, so that's uh, so that's so that's that. All right, so let's look at the downsides of contribution. Um, this is, this is largely uh, an opportunity to make some additional superannuation contributions. Uh, each person can contribute up to three hundred grand from the sale of a family home. You must have owned the home for at least 10 years. You only get one stab at this, this, this opportunity. Um, the the 1.6 million, if you have assets in super of more than 1.6 million, that doesn't matter. So this, this rule applies to everyone. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are, you can contribute the proceeds from the sale of your family home into superannuation. The sale has to be completed after you reach age, you have to be at least, aged at least 65. You can be any age you like. You can be 85 if you wish, or even older. Uh, and let's say you're moving to a smaller home, you know, you're downsizing sort of thing. What, as the, and there's no work test. So if you want to make a contribution uh, from 65 to 74 now, or before age 75 now, you've got to satisfy a ridiculous work test. Uh, you don't have to do that. So there's no, there's no work test. Uh, there's no age test uh, other than you've got to be over 65. You've got to be selling your family home. Now, there are, right, there are some situations where people have lived in a home They've moved out and rented it out, and they've moved to another place. It's now their principal place of residence. Uh, so there are rules around that. It's where your so it's where your home, where your place has actually been your former family home or the family home of uh, of uh, of let's say you have a couple who get married later in life uh, and they moved you know they moved out of the there at the time from a, a first relationship they moved out of the home they then moved into, into another place. There are rules around the ability to access the. Um, downsize of contributions in relation to that. And there are also rules around, let's say, uh, let's say my, my, uh, my partner owned, my, my wife owned, owned our house and I, I, didn't, I didn't own it, uh, instead of it being jointly owned, then I would still be able to make the contribution. So she could sell it, we could downsize and we could split the price, you know, the profitable proceeds uh, and we could then make a, make a contribution to that. Now, one of the things you need to bear in mind, however, is that of course the family home is it's not income tested under Centrelink's Centrelink or Veteran Affairs uh, income test, and it's not counted as an asset uh, under the under Veterans Affairs and Centrelink's asset tests. Obviously, if you sell the family home and you have a proceeds left over from the purchase of another another property, another 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 home, if you have proceeds left over and you contribute those to superannuation, they will be counted as an asset, and because they're sitting in superannuation, they will be deemed. So you've just got to you've just got to factor that in if that's if that is important to you. Now the other thing I need to bear you need to say as well is that although you can get the money into superannuation, if you have a transfer balance account that uh, pensions of 1.6 million, you then can't use that 300 grand to start a pension anyway. So you've got so it's if you like it goes into your pot. You can get it into super, it goes into your pot, but then you've got to work out whether or not you can actually use any of it to start a pension in the first place. So you've got to make sure you there. There are a range of little tricks and tricks and rules there that you need to make sure that you you sort out when you if you're going to use that particular rule. All right, the next one is non arms length income, and this currently applies to a very small number of self managed super funds. Uh, I had reason to go and actually have a look at this recently in the tax statistics that the ATO publishes about all taxpayers uh, and for self for self self managed superannuation funds and and APRA regulated funds. No APRA regulated fund pays non-arms length income. Less than less than 50 self-managed super funds. So out of the 600,000 funds that are running around in Australia at the moment, less than about 50 of them actually pay non-arms length income. What it is is that it is the highest marginal rate 
uh, to for non arm's length income, and it might apply to income or capital gains from private company transactions, uh, distributions from discretionary trusts, and other income where effectively you're deemed not to be dealing at arm's length. And most people have arm's length arrangements, and so they don't pay this penalty tax. A good example of this might be, let's say I, uh, I run my own business, uh, and I uh, have sold shares in that company, or I gifted shares in that company to, the, to my self-managed superannuation fund, but the current market value of those shares, let's say I, I, I gift 10 shares to my fund, and each share is worth $1,000 each in my, in, my, uh, in, my, in my company, but I gifted those shares to the fund, then that is obviously a, um, that is obviously a gift to the fund, and, uh, and that, is seen as a non, that would be seen as a non arm's length transaction. So chances are uh, I would have to deem that any, any dividends I receive, any dividends the fund receives, um, would be subject to non arm's length income. So that's, that's how it's, it's kind of meant to work. What, what is in play is that there is actually legislation before Parliament which actually expands this rule and it applies to all transactions regardless of when they started or when they, when, when they actually took place uh, and it will apply from the 18, 19 year onwards. Now it, apply, it looks at non-arm's length expenses and says okay if you have expenses that are incurred in the earning of income and they are not on a, based on a non-arm's length basis then you may have penalty tax applying. So a good example of that may be, let's say you have a limited recourse borrowing arrangement in place for your fund, uh, and you've loaned that money to your fund, and you have loaned it at zero interest rate, which is clearly a, not, not an arm's length transaction. Uh, that's a, the fund is incurring in that situation a non-arm's length expense of, of nothing. So what would happen is that this legislation would say, well, you've got an expense involved in the earning of income from whatever asset is bought with that loan, that limited recourse borrowing arrangement, that loan is, is earning income on you, we're going to tax that income that's earned from that arrangement at, at non-arm's length income rates, i.e. 40 at the highest marginal rate. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, is uh, so that's the first rule, and then the second rule is that you, ha you have been able to purchase units in a unit trust at a non-arm's length income rate. Uh, in other words, you've been, let's say you've, you've acquired units in a unit trust uh, on a non-arm's length income rate, uh, and you're thinking that, well, you know, where does, where does that, um, uh, in that situation, you may, you may incur non-arm's length income. So you've got to, if you, if you have any of those transactions, you've acquired units in a unit trust in your fund for a discount, first, firstly, or you think you may have expenses in your fund that are not based on an arm's length basis, talk to your advisors about that, because you may find already in this financial year, you may be one of the people that's earning income on an arm's length income rate. So I'm, I'm expecting that there will be a not a, sig not a very large number, but, a, but a, a larger number than people expect it to incur will actually incur, will actually be pinged by this particular rule. It's not, it's not a nice rule. Um, the government have to get it through parliament. I'll, I'll, I'll wear that. That's, uh, that's, that's not easy, as we all know, when we, you know by, by following the media and so on. But they do have to legislate it. Uh, from a legislative perspective, this is reasonably non-controversial, uh, so we, I am expecting this to go through. Um, uh, so we'll just have to we'll just have to wait and see. Whether so keep an eye on this if you think this actually does apply to you, and and if you think it does apply or might apply to you, start planning for it now. I just have a quick question, Tony, um, and it's from Gordon, who wants to know, and sorry, this is pertaining to the previous slide. If you move from a house to a new home and rent the old home, can the old home still be sold and then funds moved into super? Uh, potentially, yes. Uh, I would encourage Gordon to, uh, there, there, is, there is a very good uh, law companion ruling, legislative companion ruling that the ATO have issued. Uh, they issued it, uh, it's, I think it might be still in draft form actually, but it is available from their law website. I would encourage Gordon to read that and also speak to his advisor. So potentially, yes, there are some qualification rules around that. So just make sure that he's got all that, he's got lines up all the ducks in relation to that. All right. Okay. So. And just one other question that's just come through sure. about the non arm's length income. Uh, Jack asks, is there a problem for the super fund to lend money at market interest rates to one of its members? Uh, yes, there is a problem. Uh, and that is a problem in that you are seen to be loaning mum, you're giving what is called financial assistance to a member of the fund, uh, and that is actually not allowed. 
And even if it's market rates, no. not allowed. No. Okay, no. there you go. No. No. There you go, Jack. No. Um, well, look, unless unless you want your fund pinned by the ATO and you want to pay lots of penalty tax. So I'm assuming, um, Jack, let's let's assume Jack doesn't want to do that. So, so the short answer is no, you can't do it. Okay, let's move on. Okay. All right, so triennial SMSF audits. Now, this policy detail is still being worked on. Um, we have had a discussion paper released by the by Treasury, by the Department of Treasury, uh, and the idea behind this is that it would allow some self-managed super funds to only be audited every third year. It would be a three-yearly audit. It is not, so there's some, some confusion as to how this policy might work, but the, the policy design at the moment is that it would start from 1 July 19, that would be the first year it starts. The government's objective with this policy, they say, is to cut red tape and potentially reduce compliance costs. So if I am running my own fund uh, and I am eligible to have my fund audited only every three years, then it would mean that from July 19, if I, if I slip into this rule, I wouldn't need to get an external auditor to look at my fund until, you know, for three financial years, and they would look at the 36 months of all of my transactions. Now, um, what, what that will involve is that that will involve the auditor then going through what they normally do on an annual basis, looking at that whole three year period of time. And let's say it starts in 1 July 19. They might ask me about a transaction that occurred, say, on the 1st of August 2019. And they might be asking me about that three years ago. Uh, and what's the chance of me remembering what I did three, you know, what happened three years ago? Well, if you ask me what I was doing three years ago on, on the 1st of August 2015, I wouldn't have a clue uh, and why it occurred. So you're going to have to have a good memory. Now, there are going to be a range of funds that are ineligible for this three yearly audit. So there are going to be some funds that are going to have to are going to remain annual. Now they are as roughly as follows: people who haven't the fund, people as in funds who haven't submitted their who haven't submitted an SMSF return by the due date. Point number one: uh, at any stage in the in, in the previous period of time, funds who have been reported to the ATO for compliance breaches. And that is potentially only a small number of funds, because only a small number get reported in percentage terms, a small number of funds get reported to the ATO for compliance breaches. And secondly, funds that have certain types of transactions. And it's this type of, it's the design of all of these specific details that we're still waiting to see how it might work when the government release legislation, draft legislation and regulations. Now, the sort of transactions they're thinking this might apply to is that if your fund has a related party transaction, so as an example, let's say uh, your fund owns um, commercial real estate and your business rents that out from the fund, um, or there's some other related party transaction. Um, you have a, uh, a unit trust and you're a unit holder, you're a personal unit holder and your self-managed super fund is a unit holder. That unit trust is deemed to be a related party of your fund. So that, that, would, that, that arrangement would be out. So related party transactions probably not allowed an audit transact, not allowed, we'll start to get annual audits. But also it might apply to funds that if you start or formally start, commence or formally cease a pension in any financial year, out of not part of the three year audit or a range of other transactions. So we're still waiting to see how many this might apply to. Now there will be a group of people who say, I will, will you save money by get, only getting an audit every third year? Well, that's the $64 million question. Our members at Chartered Accounts Australia New Zealand argue that whenever they audit a, multi, a fund for a multiple number of years, it actually costs more than if they did audits for every year on a, on, on a, uh, on a single basis. So don't necessarily assume that you will save money. You may, but you may not. Uh, if this policy comes into play, the government have to legislate this change. They will have to make regulation changes. Um, at Chartered Accounts Australia New Zealand, as I said, we have members who audit SMSFs. So we have a range of members who support this policy. And we also have a number of, uh, probably a larger cohort of members who actually do not like this policy. So we're in, the, we're in, the, we're in discussions with the ATO, uh, well, in the main Treasury and the ATO about this particular policy um, to see, to make sure that if it does come into play, that it actually is a workable solution. Um, there will be people who will be attracted to it. So if I own uh, just listed shares and maybe a range of uh, bonds, which I've bought from FIG or, or similarly, um, it may be that, you know, 
those companies that are listed, say, on the ASX, well, they're all audited by some you know, external firm, and my bonds are audited by, by an external firm. Uh, so why should I, you know, and all the transactions are coming to me from an independent source. Um, Chess can verify how many shares I own, and I'm just taking the income, it goes into a bank account, that bank account's technically audited. Um, why, why, do I, why does my fund therefore need an audit? Um, I, my family trust is not audited every year. My, comp, my, my bucket company is not audited every, audited every year. Why does my fund need to be audited every year? Um, it might be that it's just cheap. You might just find that it's just cheaper. Okay, we have a question here from Bruno who asks, can funds still elect to have annual audits even though they're not obliged to do so? Um, yes, you most certainly can. You can so um, it won't be a compulsory thing. You can. It's. It's. A, it's. A, sometimes you'll have to. Sometimes you'll fall out of the system because, you've, as I say, you've done a transaction of a certain type, or your your fund your fund hasn't quite complied with hasn't complied with all of the law. So I would. Um, uh, I would. Um, it, it's not compulsory, so you can stay annual. Yeah. Um, look, for what it's worth, I think I me personally, and this is just uh, look. I don't. I don't own anything fancy in, in our fund at all. I, I would actually be eligible for three year audit. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little bit unsure at this point in time whether I'd go, I'd go for it. I think I'd probably stay with annual just because I think it's easier. It means, you know, the, the data goes through to my auditor. If, if they ask me a transaction, I'm more likely to remember it. It's just an easy, I've got the, the process is in place. I have a feeling, my gut feeling is that people might be, people might pile into, people who are eligible for the three year audit, they might pile into it thinking that, okay, well, let's, let's, let's just see how we go. If we save money, good, that's great. I think, I think once they've gone through the experience once, they might turn around and go, you know what, it's actually easy if we just go back to annual. So I think there might be an allowance for it, but I think the number of people who actually ultimately end up doing the three-year audit will actually be quite small. Um, it doesn't mean that some people won't be attracted to it because they think they might save money uh, and have less, less, less aggro. I'm not convinced that that's the case when the rubber hits the road. I think the aggro could just build for three years. You've got a, a you know a, a big a bigger problem after three years as opposed to just an annual. As that's what you're saying, really. Well, it, indeed, indeed. So let's say okay. So it starts from one. Let's it starts from July 19. Let's say I do something wrong in my fund in August 19. Well, that's not no one's and I don't know. I don't realise I've done something wrong. That's not been that may not be being find, found out for three years. Three years later, it's harder to harder to solve. Where if I've done it, I, if I did it six weeks ago or eight weeks ago or whatever it is, it's easier to tidy up rather than several financial years earlier where the H where I've actually signed financial accounts and those accounts, the, the summary of those accounts have been submitted to the ATO on my annual return. So I've actually signed those accounts to say they're accurate. So yeah, I, look, don't, don't think, I guess what I'm, where I'm going with this is that just because you think, okay, that's a great idea, I'm going to save money and it's going to be easier, I'm not convinced that's the case. All right, so let's talk about the proposed labour changes. The first of them is the negative, is, uh, there's two issues. There's negative gearing, so there's going to be limited for new housing. Um, we don't quite know the start date to that and, and the scope of that. And there's, uh, there's a halving of the capital gains tax discount for individuals, but there's no impact on self-managed super funds. Um, we'll have to wait. That's going to be based on new purchases and so on. So there's going to be a transitional date for that. We'll have to wait and see um, the scope of those. The big one is obviously franking credits. Uh, and franking credits obviously from July, potentially from July 19. Um, we did get a question yesterday as to whether or not this would require legislative change. Both of these changes, all of the, these three changes, negative gearing, capital gains tax discount and franking credits, they all require legislative change. They, they, they can't move without, without amending the law. So they've obviously got to run the gauntlet of whatever the makeup of the various houses of parliament are, assuming that they, they win the next election. And although that might seem likely at this point in time based on opinion polls and so on, as we know, you know, the old adage, it's an oldie but a goodie, um, you know, a week is a long time in politics. So they've got they've got to win an election. They've got they've only got two minor things. They've got to win an election and they've got to be able to legislate. So um, that's not that's not a sure, a sure thing. Now for people who are age pensioners or veterans pensioners on the 28th of March 18 in their self-managed super fund, they will still be able to claim a full refund of their franking credits. Uh, everyone else is out. I don't know why why they're out, but they are. Um, our gut feel is that any self-managed super fund that has uh, more than around about 10 million and earning a very healthy dose of, of franking credits probably can offset those with you know from from uh, uh, other income potentially, not not exclusively, but potentially depending on the makeup of the fund uh, from from other income they've earned. So it does have a wide impact on on individuals, uh, and the, the, hence hence the risk. And we've got a lot of questions in relation to that. So um, we do. Um, we've got quite a lot. Um, 
mainly people looking for alternatives, alternative <coughs> solutions to how do I um, derive income, you know, what, what other options are there, which is where I'm going to talk to the next slide a little, a little bit about corporate bonds mm -hmm. and how in particular hybrids, um, if you lose the capacity to uh, be able to refund, um, get those franking credit refunds, then they become much less uh, attractive that, as, that, as, a, as a product. Yeah, you're 100% correct. Mm. I, I think the thing to remember is that I think, um, uh, no offence to anyone, but we're, we're probably all old enough to remember what the system used to be back in the late 90s, where franking credits were not fully refundable and how people used to react in relation to that. So I think if we can all just uh, maybe go back into our dim, deep, deep, dark memory as to, as to the sorts of things we might have done when franking credits in the past were not fully refundable, all of that, all everything old is going to become new again. Um, but anyway, that's that. How about we move to the yeah, next let's slide? Yeah, let's move to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so this just this table is a simplified bank capital structure, and what it shows is the priority of payments in liquidation. So you have at the very top of the structure the lowest risk product uh, to, being a deposit. Um, and moving down through senior unsecured bonds or senior bonds, subordinated bonds, uh, then hybrids and shares. So this structure works um, in that each layer or level has to be um, paid out in a liquidation scenario before subsequent levels can be uh, paid. So the subordinated bonds, um, and I'm just going to talk mainly about them and compare them to the hybrids because they're the two um, asset classes I think are most interesting, but subordinated bonds uh, have a defined maturity date, <clears throat> interest must be paid on set, set dates either quarterly or half yearly and the interest uh, is known so it cannot be changed, it cannot, the company can say I'm not going to pay those interest payments this uh, quarter for whatever reason, it would then be uh, an event of default um, on the part of the company and that would instigate uh, like a wind up or a liquidation. So very important that um, payment on time at maturity and um, of income on the bonds is um, uh, it's I'm not going to say set in stone but it's it's it must be paid and companies will do all that they can to make those payments um, in in comparison the hybrids take on a lot of additional risk uh, and a far more complex um, investments so they have what's known as a call date, which subordinated bonds also have a call date, but failure to meet the call date of the hybrids, and there can be one or two, they, um, they then become perpetual instruments, so there is no maturity date, and investors must sell and take market price to recoup capital, so quite a big difference there. <clears throat> Hybrid income can also be foregone, um, it doesn't ever have to be made up, again very different to the bond. Uh, there's a couple of other terms and clauses there. One with the hybrid is a capital trigger clause. So if a bank's capital falls below 8%, it then starts to, the, the, the hybrid distribution then starts um, to be allocated on a percentage basis. So I think it might be 60%. You can then, um, they can then distribute 60% of the uh, distribution and that goes down to 5.125% uh, is sort of the base trigger when the hybrids then convert to shares and that is to protect the bondholders senior in the structure and to protect the ongoing survivability of the bank. So hybrids are known as loss absorbing instruments, really important and if you look you can look that up on the ASIC web website, they're meant to help the bank survive. So quite complex. Um, the other clause to talk about, and this actually does apply to both the subordinated bonds and the hybrids, is a non-viability clause where APRA can deem the bank non-viable and both the hybrids and the subordinated bonds convert to shares, again to boost equity and to increase the chances of survival of the bank. So you can see there's quite a lot of difference in the um, terms and conditions and the risk between these two products. So if we look across the table at yield per annum, the current yields available on these uh, securities, you'll see sub subordinated bonds 4% and you'll also see hybrids 4%. But the hybrids can, and investors at the moment, can claim franking credits. So that actually takes the, the income to five, about 5.7% 5 on the hybrids. But if you lose that franking income or the capacity to claim it back, you're then only earning 4% equivalent to the bond. And this is where we're urging investors to rethink perhaps their asset allocation. And if you're invested in hybrids, 
perhaps think about substituting with bank subordinated bonds. I don't want to talk too much about this, but I just want to make the point uh, that corporate bonds and bank corporate bonds are perhaps a, a place that you can go to get a lower risk investment for a like-minded return if you can't claim the franking credits. Of course, the other option is to go the other way and to invest more in shares, but um, our research and in fact industry research suggests uh, investors have too much uh, invested in bank shares at this point. I'll leave you to perhaps have, come back and have a look at that table and we'll continue on. Uh, we, we have got some of those questions regarding franking credits. So um, I will pose some of those and we'll ha have a go answering them. Mm -hmm. um, so Gary asks, forewarned is forearmed. In the event Labor wins the next election and assuming they can introduce the legislation on imputation credits. Is there anything an SMSF can do either now or at that time to ameliorate the effects, apart from keeping some assets in accumulation mode? Um, yes, certainly. Well, um, pension phase is obviously nil taxed, and so there's no offset. Um, the other thing is, of course, uh, uh, accumulation phase is taxed at 15. So of course the 15 is going to be going to be offset there. So it's, it's going to it's going to come down to how much tax the uh, how much tax is actually payable in the in the accumulation phase. Those with more money in their fund are obviously going to be able to offset offset you know have have more ability to offset. Um, so you need a reasonable sum of money in there. Um, the other the other option of course is to uh, you know as as we all know um, reassess whether or not a self managed super fund is the right place to be holding these assets. Uh, actually, there is there is there is a concept that I was just uh, just thought of, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, uh, is that one of, one of the things you could look at doing is uh, maybe closing down the self managed superannuation fund because we know that we pay more tax in our own marginal rates, but of course older people have uh, have the benefit of of the senior Australian pension as tax offset and so on and so forth. But often have have access to that. Uh, and so uh, have a much higher uh, effective, much much higher effective tax-free threshold than than ordinary wage and salary earners. So that that may not necessarily work. The other option is that you in a fund you just stop paying pensions whatsoever, and so the whole fund becomes taxed at 15. So you then have more more ability to wash, you know, to, to claim some of these franking credits. Um, the third option is that you try and get rid of a whole bunch of money and become an age pensioner. Um, that's that's another option. Um, but I'm not entirely, you know, you're not necessarily exempt in the fund because you may not necessarily meet that threshold date of March at the end of March this uh, this year. Uh, the third option is is shut your fund down and move to an APRA fund if you want to retain uh, the shareholding investments, blah blah blah. And of course, that's um, that's a, you know, there's, there's lots of decisions to go through there. But if, but if you if you do think you're going to have excess franking credits, one of the things you could do is move to an APRA fund that actually has the ability, who is who has a much larger fund. That is a much larger tax liability, and you might still be able to get the same asset allocation. It's probably going to cost you more money to run the fund. Uh, you've got state planning issues, uh, and so on. So, you, but you might find that the large fund can actually make use of all of your franking credits, which otherwise would have been lost in your fund. Uh, and then, obviously, as, as Liz was saying, you, you might want to look at changing your asset allocation completely uh, and working out what what works from there. So, there's there's a range of different options. So, I agree with that. Forewarned is forearmed. And I think uh, anyone, you know, if you if you're a, a casual observer of politics, I think you should be you should be factoring this into future because it will impact it will in, it will likely impact your income levels. Mm. Mm. There's a lot to think about. So if you had hybrids now, could you sell them and put them into some sort of managed investment scheme or something else that if might the, then protect the, you know. Like I know there are hybrid, for example, hybrid funds. Not that I would choose to invest in that, but uh, well, hy hybrids are generally listed, aren't they? They are listed. Yeah. So because they're listed on the exchange, now it'll depend on whether or not a a large fund is actually what is. So some you'll find some large funds will only accept certain type of ASX listed securities. They won't necessarily accept all of them. Right. So if you want, if you have hybrid, if you're saying, okay, well, I've got hybrids in in my in my SMSF. And I would, and I, and I like the idea of closing my fund out, or whatever it might be. You know, whatever your circumstances are, or even transferring some of my money out of the fund, or even my pension money, blah blah blah. Whatever, whatever you decide to do, and you go, okay, I'll move the money into the Africa. You want it, whatever fund you move to, you want to make sure that they can accept whatever your asset holdings are. Right. A lot of them can, but some of them can't. You know, some of them choose not to. So, as an example, there are a range of APRA funds 
where they only accept a small range of listed investment companies, some exchange traded funds, and the ASX 300. Now, that's not hybrids. No. Yeah, so you want to you want to check with a fund whether or not they actually would be able to take those across. You know, you can transfer them across through the chess system that they would actually take them on, and they can actually then administer those uh, behind the scenes into your into your account. Mm -hmm. um, we've got so many questions here, and I'm going to just apologise if I don't get to yours. I'm hoping we can cover it fairly fairly broadly. Um, people are talking about transferring um, in specie. Um, from their fund to themselves, so holding the assets in a different way, is that? Yes, yeah, so what? So you can do that. Now, what you would be doing is you're actually making a lump sum payment mm -hmm. out of the fund. So you're actually doing, if, you, if it's in a pension, you've got to stop the pension, then you've got to make, you take the money out. Now, depending on your, if you're, at, let's assume you're over 60, in which case the lump sum, the money comes out tax-free, you've got the, you've, effectively the fund is selling the assets. So that is, you know, you, you've got to make sure you, you, uh, you sort that out. Um, and you've got to make sure you, you fix everything up there appropriately within the fund itself. In other words, do proper account, uh, not only the financial accounting, but the tax accounting, but you're actually making a benefit payment and you can make benefit payments in specie as long as it's done at market value. Okay, great. We've got a question from Viz, Vizwa. Is there a difference between how franking credits are paid back to funds through an SMSF and an APRA regulated fund? Uh, in principle, Vizwa, no. There's no, there's exactly the same. Um, so the whole this, the process is exactly the same. The, the difference is is that an APRA fund has lots of members with lots of employer contributions. It probably has more money in accumulation phase than it has in pension phase, and just has more ability to soak up any franking credits that they have in the pension phase. As people as as more and more of us get older, though, that will change in 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 APRA funds. So there'll be a cohort of APRA funds that actually already I actually know of some APRA funds which actually um, have exactly the same, a lot of SMSFs, there are some APRA funds that have exactly the same problem because they have more pensioner members than they have accumulation members. Of course, yes. So it's, it, the principles are exactly the same. Right. So there are some funds out there, you know, a lot of them are closed, you know, maybe only for, you know, in a variety of situations, we haven't got time to talk about how these funds have been created. But there are APRA funds where they would have 99% of their members, maybe even 100% of their members in pension phase. So they have exactly the same issue. We've all got it. We all have to deal with it. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. And whereas, whereas you'll have other members, yeah, other funds where they might have 80% of their members in accumulation phase and 20% in pension phase. So that but that fund in that member makeup, they've got a much greater because they're getting lots of employer contributions. They've got much greater ability. So in a much more tax to pay in the fund, they can soak up that tax liability. All right. Um, I think we'll move on. Okay. All right. It's a, it's a big it's a big topic and Look, lots to think to about and um, certainly see your financial advisor. Um, uh, lo so many options, I think. Now. Yeah. It, look, indeed. Uh, and look, I would be encouraging you to talk to your administrator and accountant about what the impact of, for your fund might be. And I know um, you know the, the the policy itself hasn't been fully designed. There may be some more concessions that they offer along the way. Maybe not before the election. Um, a lot of find, a lot of people find this a very complex topic. So I think the ability to talk about this in you know on the TV and the radio it's somewhat limited because we're talking about complex tax structures. You know, relatively speaking, relatively complex tax structures, which is a very you know it's pretty dry and, comp and, and it's it's difficult to talk about that in a very simple way. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure that this has much cut through from a, from a uh, an election perspective, if that makes sense. It does obviously in some cohorts. You know, there's a lot. Of, some people are impacted very greatly, others not at all. Um, so th there might be some concessions later on, but once once the, they get to the, the legislative design phase. Uh, so, but I would encourage you to talk to your advisors and accountants as required, and fully understand what this might mean for you. And then, if necessary, considering what adjustments you might make. Um, fortunately, we have enough. We have. We all have enough time to adjust. But you know, time waits for no no one. So we've got to make sure that we're 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 ready to ready to roll if we need to, ready to rumble if we need to. Great. All right. Okay. So interesting court cases now. Cam and Bear versus McGoldry. This was actually written up in the Financial Review recently. This court case. So there was two court. There was actually two court cases here. One was uh, one was in the Supreme Court of uh, the New South Wales Supreme Court, and then the other one was in the Court of Appeal, uh, the New South Wales Court of Appeal. So Cam and Bear was the trustee. It's actually Cam and Bear Proprietary Limited. Cam and Bear was the trustee of a self-managed superannuation fund. McGoldrick was their auditor. 
Um, the Cam and Bear, Cam, the people in the, the members of the Cam, of the Cam and Bear Superannuation Fund elected to put their money into certain types of investments. Uh, the investments that they put the money into unfortunately went bad and were described in the financial accounts as cash. Now, they were described as cash, but they weren't really, they were actually unsecured, it was actually unsecured le um, lending. They were actually le loaned on an unsecured basis. Huge difference in risk there. <laughs> Indeed, and they loaned it to an entity that was related to the administrator of the fund, and the administrator recommended the auditor, to the recommended said, okay, well, how about we use Mr. McGoldrick to audit our funds? And the person they gave the money to on an unsecured basis went belly up. So Cam and Bear said, look, McGoldrick said, we, we were quite happy with this. We thought cash meant cash. Uh, we didn't think it meant unsecured borrowings. And if, and if Mr. McGoldrick had done his job properly, we would, have, we would have acted accordingly. Now, the New South Wales Supreme Court said, yes, Mr. McGoldrick hasn't done the right thing. Uh, he should have investigated, should have worked out that this was, was incorrectly described. Uh, he didn't do, you know, was, was negligent. But he also said to the trustees of the fund, even if McGoldrick had turned around to you and said, um, you are a bit naughty, you have done the wrong thing. Um, he said, even if they said, this is not, this stuff's not cash, you still would have, you still would have done what you were planning, you still would have done what you were planning to do. Um, and so, in other words, they're basically saying, you wouldn't have listened to him. So the court said, Court, initially, the court said to Cam and, the Cam and Bear trustees, Cam and Bear Proprietary Limited, said, yep, you've won the court case, uh, but your problem is, is that we're not going to give you any compensation and you can pay Mr McGoldrick's court costs. So although you've won the case, you get to pay McGoldrick's court costs and your own court costs and you get no compensation. So the trustees weren't very happy with that. So they appealed to the Supreme, they appealed to the Court of Appeal and they won that case 3-0. So of course, there's, there's three judges here in that particular case. They said, yes, McGoldrick is negligent. We still don't know what the compensation is there. So the reason why this is an interesting court case is that this is the first time, to the best of my knowledge, that action has been taken by the trustee of a self-managed super fund against the work of the auditor of the fund for not making sure that the assets have been accurately described in the financial accounts. So it's a very interesting case uh, and one that is being, being looked at very carefully by a lot of SMSF auditors. Um, because, you know, how do you know, you know, their job is to make sure that the assets are accurately described as. So it's very easy. Uh, if my fund owns, let's say, uh, you, you know, a, a, a large company listed on the on the ASX, you know, one of the top 20 companies, let's say, it's very easy for them to go to the chess system and see that, okay, yes, well, actually, you know, we can actually confirm that, you know, the shares are in so on and so forth. But when you get away from things like that or bonds or whatever it might be, it's much harder to verify. So the, um, the more complex, I guess, your fund is in terms of as the assets it owns, Expect your auditor maybe to be doing a little bit more work to verify that what you say it is, it actually is, if that makes sense. All right, so that's the first court case. The second court case involves the, um, the deceased estate of a gentleman by the name of Mr. Hems. Uh, as I said, um, the Hems family are involved in owning pubs and clubs in uh, here, principally here in Sydney, in the, in the Sydney uh, metropolitan area. Um, now, what happened was is that Mr. Hems died with um, owning, as I understand it, according to the court case, died owning more, owing more money than he actually had in his in his own name. Um, his family live in, in, however, his family live in a reasonably nice residence in in uh, Vaucluse uh, or, or near Vaucluse here in here in Sydney. Um, but he didn't actually personally own any of that real estate, as I understand it. Now he had a child. Uh, out of wedlock, who's been married to the to the same, as I understand it, to the same same woman for very many years, and from that marriage had two children, two adult children, uh, both of whom I think run the the this pub and club empire. Um, he had a child out of wedlock, um, whom after after because of a family law court case, uh, actually paid child child maintenance to, but otherwise, apart from paying child's maintenance, had very had no relationship with this particular individual. So uh, Mr. Hems just, uh, died. Uh, and then his, his uh, for want of a better term, his estranged son elected to say so he, he was, there was no allocation in the estate for him. And so what he did was that he said, well, look, I don't think that's very fair and commenced legal action against the estate. Uh, and what the estate agreed to do was that they agreed to take money out of a, out of self-managed superannuation funds 
uh, plural. I don't know how many funds because it doesn't. The court case doesn't say, but took money out of the self-managed super funds, agreed to hold it in escrow until this court case was determined, and the son was able to acquire some of that uh, some of that money out of those self-managed superannuation funds. Now, in here in here in New South Wales, where where we are. Um, we actually have what is called the Family Provisions Act. Part of the fam there are family provisions uh, where if you if transactions have been done over a period of time uh, and you're not happy with your allocation, if you can show that you are a relative of the deceased, you can seek to get the will overturned on the basis that inadequate provision had been made for you. Now there has been some doubt as to whether or not those family provisions rules in the wills and estates legislation here in New South Wales actually applied to superannuation. This is the first, one of the first major cases where it seems, and there's actually been a second one in time, where it would seem that the, that the money that you might be putting into superannuation can also be extracted in order to satisfy the, 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 um, the, what the court deems are legitimate claims of, um, of people you haven't made provision for. So this is something that I, the reason why this is an interesting court case is that if you live in any state but in, or have assets, your own assets here in New South Wales, uh, and you have a situation whereby you, you've had uh, one or more relationships and you, you have family who you think might claim on your estate, just make sure you factor in, okay, well, I have money in my self-managed super fund or another superannuation fund. Just factor in, the, just factor in that it may be that, your, that that family member can actually claim on those superannuation assets. So speak to your wills and estates lawyers and talk to them about whether or not they can that can be claimed on, and what you might be able to do in order to um, not 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 allow that to happen, or, or can ameliorate it in some way. So make sure make sure you understand how how all of that fits together. Fascinating. Yeah. Look, this is um, this Hems case, and as I say, there was a second case recently, which of which we didn't which I haven't detailed here because it's actually a little bit more complex even than, than this Hems case. Um, uh, I would in, uh, so we've had two cases in the last three, three months, four months or so, where this this is where self-managed super fund money has actually been used to satisfy a family provisions case here in New South Wales. Um, uh, it, New South Wales is the only state that has the family provisions laws, but it doesn't mean that in other states you can't run a similar action. And of course, there are a lot of people who live who don't live in New South Wales who own assets based here in New South Wales. Just a few more complexities for the bucket. Indeed, indeed. Mm, mm. Okay, all right. So that's that's the court cases. So let's now talk about the royal. Let's uh, let's finish off just very quickly with the um, with the royal commission and the productivity commission. I'll start with the second one first, if you don't mind, Liz. No, go for it. Okay, so the productivity commission, as I said, they released a very brief 550-page draft report. They've they've called they call for submissions in relation to that draft report, and many people made submissions to it. You can go onto their website and, and, and read those at your leisure if you wish. Um, now they made some fairly uh, fairly interesting findings, uh, changing things that we we probably you know now is not the time to, to be talking about. But this is but the productivity commission. What will happen is that they will uh, they will issue a final report towards the end of the calendar year, more than likely, uh, and then the government will assess that and then make some decisions going forward. Uh, and um, we will then have to wait and see what what ultimately the government will then consider it. Um, and either accept or reject any of the, any any or all of the um, uh, any or all of the re the recommendations that it receives from the Productivity Commission. We will have to see where all that goes. Um, as I say, they made some fairly uh, interesting findings. Um, there will be no fund. I think there will be no fund that is not impacted by the product. How I, I can't say because it's a bit too early. But there will be no no fund ultimately that is not impacted by the Productivity Commission findings uh, in one form or fashion. Um, there will be flow on impacts for a number of years, I think. I know I was reading just recently, people were um, making submissions to the commission yeah. that it, um, an SMSF had to be a minimum amount. So yeah, one, one I'd read, it had to be a minimum a million dollars, which seems quite high. But then they were arguing smaller um, SMSFs didn't make enough money or not high enough returns. Yes, now there's, there, is some, there is some doubt about the um, uh, it's a bit difficult to know how the how the productivity actually made their determination. Looking at the uh, looking at how they you know compare. Let me go back one step. I am not. I'm yet to be convinced that the productivity commission was looking at the right data to make that make that assessment. Um, I, I have a suspicion that there was some. So they relied on ATO data, and I think the ATO data includes some expenses 
and some items that are not included in APRA data when they work out annual returns and they were comparing like for like at that particular point in time. So I'm not convinced they were comparing like for like. Um, we will have to wait and see whether or not that is the case, but that is the suspicion at this point in time. So um, would the product, so the Productivity Commission might make a recommendation to the government, yes, there does need to be a minimum amount of assets. What we know, what we, what we know is that there are a lot of people who start their fund with not a lot of money in the fund and over time build it up. Um, I remember we started our fund with a thousand bucks and then we transferred money in from our other funds. So it, prima facie then, does that mean that I've started, that, that I, under those rules, I couldn't start my fund because I didn't have the money available at the point in time. Um, mm. I think there are a lot of people who start their fund with not a lot. And as I say, they either get money from other funds or they contribute large amounts of money over the first one or two years. It's just the way, it's the natural evolution of how the fund is run. They've got a plan about how they're actually going to use this thing, start small and then, and then go from there. However, there are a cohort of people who are running small funds who should reevaluate why, why do I have this thing? Um, and they should be looking and saying, is this actually worth my while? There is also a cohort of people who run a very small, a fund with a very small account balance because it makes sense for them personally. They might own a particular type of asset in the fund that they want in there. They might be a day trader and you know they, want, they think, okay, well, I'll, I'll hive off part of my retirement money into a special little fund and I'll, I'll muck around with that. You know, it'll be my, if you like, my playground from an investment perspective. So there's a range of people who legitimately have a small fund. Um, but I don't, I, look, I, I'd be surprised if that rule comes into play myself. It, it, I'm not, far be it from me to say what will or won't, but I'd be surprised. All right, now the Royal Commission, um, again, um, you know, the next, uh, the remainder of this week and, and all of next week, the superannuation sector is gonna be uh, reviewed by the Commission. The Commission will, will issue an interim report towards the end of next month which will not involve its findings in relation to superannuation, that will come later this year. So they'll, they're gonna, they wanna go away and think about what they've found in relation to the superannuation industry. Uh, just as the first two days of hearings, the, if you read the Hansard or listen to it or watch it, it hasn't been very pretty. The remainder of this week and all of next week also will not be pretty for the, for the sector. That is the reality. Um, and well, that's my prediction, it's about, about the, the remainder of the period of time. Um, again, I don't think any fund in Australia will not be impacted, any financial transaction will not be probably impacted by the findings of the Royal Commission. Again, they have to make recommendations, the government have to consider it, then we have to leave the legislation and so on. So we're a long way from anything really happening in relation to this. Um, there are a lot of people who are expressing surprise about the Royal Commission and what, it's, what it has actually revealed. Um, I'm personally, I'm surprised that people are surprised. Uh, so. I just think, you know, what rock have you been living under that you that you haven't worked out that conflicted remuneration make, creates conflict? Um, uh, and that, you know, whether, whether we like it or not, there are some people who are in the financial game for their own benefit. And if their clients do well out of it, well, that's, that's great, but I'm, I'm here for me. So I, I just think um, we shouldn't be surprised by, by what comes, I don't think we should be surprised by what the Royal Commission finds. It is, it is good that these things are, are talked about a little bit more openly. Uh, I personally haven't really been that surprised as I'm probably indicating by, what, by what's actually been discussed. Um, but we'll, it'll, be, it'll be years before this, this stuff washes through the system in, form, in terms of formal rules. But certainly more compliance for banks and there was just that discussion this week about um, APRA putting putting their staff into the banks. Yeah, APRA and ASA, well, I think it's ASA, uh, yeah. Oh, so so the, the, well, the regulators anyway, mm. uh, putting themselves into, you know, uh, being physically present. Um, uh, as, as, as we all know, um, the, the banks are very large organisations and are in a lot of places. Um, so I don't know how thinly the, the ASIC people are gonna be spread on the ground amongst all the various offices that the, the, the banks, all the banks have. Um, I guess they'll have to work that. They'll, they'll work all that out. Plus Thanks. reporting and so on and so forth. So we'll we'll see we'll see what that where, where that leads to. Okay. Um, probably time for a couple of questions. Sure. Um, so we have a question here from David. Please comment on the proposed amendment to the work rule allowing a one-off relaxation in the rule in restricted circumstances. Okay. So um, that is a proposed change. We haven't seen any uh, any draft rules in relation to that. That was an announcement in the in the budget. Um, the government will allow for people with a relatively a smaller amount of money not to have to sat once only not to not to have to satisfy the work test once they get to at least age sixty five and less than seventy four. This is not the downsizer stuff. This is actually in addition to that. 
Um, as I say, we, we haven't seen any draft rules. So all we have is the announcement that was in the budget. So that's made, you know, it was very, very uh, thin on the ground for want of a better term, as far as how it would actually work in, in specific detail. So we're gonna have to wait and see how that rule actually works in, in principle. Um, but that's that's what it's, so it's a once, it's a once only rule. Uh, so David asks, with reference to HEMS, would binding debt benefit nominations in favour of other beneficiaries have prevented the claim on the SMSF? That's a very good question, David. Um, it's a, that's, that's difficult to know. Um, I, I, look, I, I, um, uh, the, the, how, the, how the funds themselves uh, were structured and the way, way benefits were going to be paid out of the funds was actually not discussed in the court case. Uh, and it would, it, it, I, it would be, you know, I haven't seen any of the documentation, you know, I haven't seen any of the court documentation, so I'm not privy to any of the finer detail. So I don't know that. Um, looking at how they elected to use the proceeds in the fund to satisfy the the claim by the by this by the uh, the stepson, or well, not the stepson, but the son the son not born from Mr. Hem's marriage, uh, I don't know. So I don't know how they actually came to make that decision that they'll use those proceeds rather than maybe some of the other money that the family may have had access to. I don't know how they came to to make that decision. Um, now, if you had a binding nomination, the whole pro principle behind a binding nomination is that the money goes out straight away to the beneficiaries as nominated, as long as the trustee deems that, that nomination to be accurate and effective. Um, so that may, that, may have, that may have worked, or maybe, uh, look, it's, it's complicated. I don't know, we'd need to see some of the docu further documentation to know if that would work. Okay, uh, a couple of quick questions I think here. Um, uh, Cole asks, uh, do you believe an SMSF should be breached if a bank account is not exactly named as per the trust deed? Uh, well, um, what you are required to do, Cole, is that you have to have the assets of the fund in the name of the f name of the trustee. And if we, let's say we have a corporate trustee, so we have XYZ Proprietary Limited as trustee of the Smith Family Super Fund or Smith Self Family Super Fund. That's how you should ideally have it. You should have XYZ proprietary limited as trustee or trustee for um, the, X, the Smith Smith superannuation self managed superannuation fund. So you should ideally have that. Um, without that, how how can the auditor be sure that we're actually talking about the right bank account? Um, I think it makes it a lot clearer. Um, I think it makes it a lot simpler. Um, your auditor, in my view, your auditor be, should probably be saying something to you. Um, that you don't have the asset, a major asset of the fund in the in the name of the name of the fund itself. So I, I think that's I think it should be it should probably be done. Great. Um, William has a question. Um, let me just. Uh, what advice would you give a couple with an SMSF that is managed by one partner and the other party is passive, and the active partner is no longer able to do the management? Uh, okay, well let's let's uh, let's not talk about why they're not able to do it. So that might be for mental or physical, you know, incapacity. Um, that is a that is a very common thing. Um, in, in those situations, uh, you you should either be looking at uh, so so. Firstly, do you need to get the court to a court to agree that the individual themselves cannot act for themselves anymore? Uh, and you know that that often does involve you know going to the court and getting the court to sign off on that. So uh, you know someone can't legally act for themselves anymore due to mental or physical reasons. So that's the first thing. Then then should you be saying okay, well I personally don't have the capacity to run this fund because I don't have either the knowledge or the scope or the time or whatever it might be. You know you might be busy looking after your your your, your spouse uh, on a on a relatively full time basis. Uh, in which case you don't have the time, ability, or scope to to manage the fund. In which case you maybe consider should consider closing the fund down and winding up the fund. Uh, I'll just warn you though that winding up the fund it, it is a bit of it's it's a trick it's a itty bitty process to be honest with you it's it's, it's trick you know there's lots of lots of moving parts um, and uh, and it takes time so it's not it's not something you, can, you know you can't say if you can't decide today I'm going to wind my fund up and tomorrow it's done it, it does take time you've got to sell the assets you've got to pay tax liability you've got to get the fund audited you've got to do this you've got to do that you've got to stop you may have to stop pensions there's a there's a there's a Bit of mucking around to do. Talk to your advisors and accountants about that, I, I think. But it, um, your, your best court, court of action might be to close the fund down. Uh, you might get a guardian appointed by the court, uh, and you might have someone who can help you run the fund. 
that may that may be an option as well. So there's a range of options for you, but closing the funders down, getting someone else to help you run the fund. First part of first part of call though is to consider whether or not you actually need to get the um, the court to a point to say yes, this person can't act for themselves if they, if that's an appropriate. Thing. Okay. Um, Neville's asked a whole range of questions and Neville I just want to thank you but we might um, take those aside from, from the webinar today uh, and I just wanted to um, put, put forward a question from Chris and I won't say it in your exact words Chris but Chris is wondering is, if he has a $1 million super fund uh, and he wants to, can he give away some of his assets, How, can he um, reduce the amount, let me see if I can get this right. Um, if you can't put any excess into accumulation mode, um, which is the makes the uh, amount non-accessible, and bring my assets down to a level which gets me, he's after the healthcare card, and depending on the maths, maybe um, a pension amount. So he's probably looking at trying to move his assets around yeah, to so try and get the, so the benefits of in, pension and, and accumulation. He's trying to do what's called gifting. So right, he's okay. Trying to gift the money. Okay. So uh, under Centrelink and Veteran Affairs, there are, um, anti-avoidance rules in relation to gifting. Um, so what he should do is make sure he's, he's fully understand those gifting rules because there are, you know, they start before you retire. Uh, so, you know, let's say I'm 61, 62 and I try and give money away, then it may trap my money. But if I'm if I'm currently an age pensioner, so I'm over 65 at least, uh, and I uh, want to give money away so I get hold of the age, the healthcare card and the age pension, then um, there are, as I say, there are gift, what I call gifting and what I call gifting anti-avoidance rules, but they're really, they're called the gifting rules. So um, just make sure you Google those and, and have a read of them and talk to Centrelink about it too. Okay. Um, I think that's getting close to finalising the presentation. Do you have anything else you want to chat about, Tony? Any advice or suggestions you want to give to our listeners today? Yes, look, um, I, I, I would just go back to, um, I, I, if you don't mind, um, I, I just think it's very important that people make sure that the the, um, the Morrison Turnbull O'Dwyer changes from the first announced in 16, legislated with pretty much with effect from July 17, were very far reaching, were quite complex. Uh, and I would encourage people to make sure that they actually do review to make sure that they actually really understand. They really make sure they got all that squared away properly. Just do a very, do your own review, do, you know, talk to your advisor and accounts to make sure that everything's been squared away really finely because, you know, the, the consequences of getting it all wrong is, is not very not very nice. Um, so that's the main, that's my main takeaway. Um, the other one is is really understand whether or not the family provision rules might apply to your 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 fund. Uh, and then of course with rank, you know, obviously with ranking credits, there's a lot of things to decide as well about this AFP policy. So um, and 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 keep enjoy keep enjoying watching the Royal Royal Commission. I think they're, so. They're my they're my three three or four takeaways. It, it can be very entertaining. Um, I just want to thank you very much on behalf of all our um, clients and potential clients on on the line today. Thank you for joining us and imparting your wisdom. Pleasure. I know we've raced through some of these topics, and hopefully at some future date we might have Tony back mm -hmm. to uh, um, answer more individual questions. But thank you so much, and thank you for joining us today. We will be sending a, a copy of the recording to you either later today or tomorrow, so you can uh, re-listen, slow down, check the slides, check some of the names of the court cases, etc. Um, thank you very much for joining. If Fig, if anyone, Fig, myself or anyone here at Fig can help you, um, if you're interested in corporate bonds, please let us know. But that now concludes the presentation. Good morning, have a have a good rest of the day.